Next game, losers bracket everybody. Dragonshire is our first map in the best of three here. And we got the FBI against the Enjoyers. The full body investigation. Uh, sorry, like furiously bloody investigation or something. But yeah, that's clearly a lost opportunity. We're back with the Banshee Cup. Qualifier number one. As mentioned before, we have $2,500 on the line for the Banshee Cup. All thanks to Psykiff slash Kevin, who is currently the sugar daddy of the Heroes of the Storm community. There's no other way to say this. The man has been organizing the event in Berlin. He has obviously organized the two events that we had in Miami since he owns the land center that we've been using for the internationals. And he's also the one that sponsors the prize pool for the Banshee Cup. And the entire title is an homage to his unhealthy obsession with Sylvanas. The man has something between 7,000 and 8,000 games with Sylvanas. So something is clearly going on here. I always suspected that Sylvanas has a lover. And I think now it's definitely confirmed. So yeah, big shout out to Kevin. And we are in the first qualifier still. We got a best of five here. And the FBI is signing up for the first time today. So first of all, I want to welcome them. And, you know, all of these people that are jumping into the comments with every qualifier is like, Oh my god, these people are so bad. Like, this looks like bronze. This looks like my diamond games. Yeah, they actually came together and put a team together. So big kudos to them. Always respect it when uh, people come up and uh, bring new teams in and are not afraid, you know, to go against some of the more established teams that have more experience. Experience. It's the only way you're going to get better. Go up against teams that have more experience than you, that might be a bit stronger than you, learn from it and see how far you can go. So, shout out to the FBI. Welcome to the tournament scene here. And, well, let's see what they can pull off now. On Dragonshire, they already got the king of Dragonshire. We got Rexa in the house. And then we got the Ritchu with Jojo and Junkrat played by Ether, as it seems. Now, when it comes to the drafting rules, we're not going to have any pre-bans in the entire tournament. It's not going to be a thing. We just came from Meta Madness, so it's actually cool to see a lot of these heroes coming back and not pre-banned. But we still implement the rule where you only can pick a hero once within a series. It's just simply nicer. It's nice if it's just not all day, every day, the Genji, Hanzo show. So, yeah, that rule is still in play. But we have a little bit of a twist prepared for you that comes into play for the playoffs. And as I already hinted before, it's just a tease. I'm not going to tell you what it is just now. So you have to wait a little bit. It's, pretty, it's a pretty cool idea, I think, though. I think you're going to like it. So, six qualifiers in total. This is the first one. Diablo getting banned against them. We got Alex Straza and Mephisto now on Dragonshire. So definitely a couple of preference picks already. And what's the final ban against the Enjoyers? Who find themselves in the loser's bracket right now, but generally have done uh, pretty well in the winner bracket and had some pretty cool games there too. I gotta admit that the first round, or like just the winner bracket in general, was highly entertaining. A lot of the picks... I were a little bit suspicious where you looked at it and was like, do they know that it's not Meta Madness anymore? We had a Cho'Gal, we had Murky, we had Nova. I mean, <laughs> we went all out on the draft. So that yeah, was very, very funny. But yeah, now we're in the loser's bracket. So if you lose the series here, then you're out of the tournament. And we get an Ana. Ana and Sylvanas. So the Banshee Queen herself is in the house. Okay. With Ana being picked here, I would still expect that we're gonna get an additional mage. I don't, I mean, unless obviously they don't want to go for an auto boost here, but a mage is highly likely at this point. On the side of the FBI, we got, well, I like the, the coffee nickname, by the way. I just had my, my own coffee right now. Amazing, so yeah. But it's empty, unfortunately. I need a new one. An Uberak and Falstad are the picks here. And actually, Calder merch. Same as here. Link in the description if you haven't checked it out yet. Not only do we have the Heroes Gaming Community, but also we have some Trashwing stuff. Which I still regret to the day that I actually made that one of the collections in the merch shop, but hey, whatever. <laughs> Final pick, Alvaros with Blaze. So we got Jojo Blaze, always a solid front line for the first map between the FBI and the Enjoyers. Let's go. The Enjoyers against the FBI. We got on the left side, Lavakal playing Anna, Arian with Sylvanas for the blue team, Ethan, Junkrat, Alvarus is playing Blaze, and we have Richu on Johanna. Over on the right side of the map, the five agents that they could pull from the January 6th commission and investigation. We have Curtis on Rexa, Olanka on Alexstrasza, Rectinoob on Anuburak, Sereni on Mephisto, and 
Coffee is playing Falstad. Honestly, I'm looking at the team name here and I'm really thinking I'm missing so many stupid jokes that I could make, but at this point in time, there's very little that comes to mind. So you have to make do with whatever I can, up, uh, can, I can come up with here. But anyways, we now are looking at an opportunity for those boys to make it to the next round, but the Enjoyers are not an easy team to beat. If anything, they are surprising me. They were already pretty awesome to watch in the Meta Madness uh, matches that they played in, but even in this tournament, in the winner bracket, they had some really solid games there. So the Polish team is going to try and do their best at this point. All the way at the top, we already have a bit of an attack against Blaze going, uh, sorry, Rex are going on as they're trying to go for the kill here. Misha able to make it out for now, and so does Rexa. Alex Straza obviously stacking. Every time I see Alex Straza, it reminds me that we had yesterday an opportunity to get Alex Straza with Hungry for More on Stitches, and then Stitches just absolutely like brain farted and didn't pick it. And yeah, they would have won the game obviously if they would have gone for the meme synergy, but yeah, it's a sad, sad day. Anyways, Coffee is currently going for the camp and we're gonna see the same thing over on the left side from the blue team. So Sylvanas is already getting busy here. We're gonna try and set up the top lane, maybe push with her a bit more aggressively. Down to the bottom of the map, Siege Giants have been taken too. So the blue team is a little bit faster when it comes to locking all of those mercenary camps in. And it might empower Ether to get some damage against the bottom wall. Yeah, now that Alex Straza and Mephisto are here, probably not. But, yeah, we'll see what they can uh, pull off of this. Top side, on the other hand, Alvarus still doing his thing. We're now looking also at the Boom Pow. We have the Incinerator Gauntlets. And, yep, it's party time. Bot lane gets pushed. Siege Giants are still alive. And at the top, they're trying to do a very similar thing. There's only one global on the map, though. So with Falset in their hands, the FBI has at least an option to make a couple of pretty neat plays later on. That was a pretty damn good move by Junkrat though, and it nearly costs Mephisto's life. So that hurt for sure. Falset is now rotating over into the middle of the map and is trying to get some experience for the team there. Haven't lost the hero yet. Top side, we got Lace, stunned out by Misha on the other hand. Jet Propulsion, all right, but Alvarus needs to be really careful. Body blocking is in play, and oh, damn. They just missed out on the kill. 70 hit points is all he had towards the end, and now instead it is a coffee that goes down, and I cannot blame Sylvanas at all. She wanted some coffee, and she got some coffee. I got some coffee, too. Always a cup before the stream. That's what we're going for here. So, yeah. Nicely done. Yeah, I, I told this before, but I'm actually mixing coffee beans these days. I have like a normal blend and then I have decaf beans that I'm mixing into it. Just simply because I'm drinking way too much coffee. So I'm trying to cut down on the caffeine at least a little bit. And in my head it makes perfect sense to just mix the two. So I'm reducing my caffeine intake by half and I'm not missing out on the taste. Pretty amazing. Con Gaveta. Well, that's a bit of a killing field here. Also, Dragonite snuck in at the same time. Sylvanas down, Falstead down, and a DK in the middle. A blue team pulling ahead a bit and also getting level 7 talents. So, we have them with a the talent lead. Experience advantage, obviously, therefore. And they are now using Ana on the Dragonite to get damage in in the mid wall. It's going to be an easy one to break through. But they can maybe also do a bit more down at the bottom, but the wall has already fallen. So, they can start their attack against the fort itself. Enjoyers are obviously the favorites here. I mean, they have a whole lot more experience in tournaments than uh, the FBI does. And, well, for now, it's gonna be Sylvanas trying to... Oh, choo-choo! I like the choo-choo mount. It doesn't come close to the money pick. I gotta still admit that, but the choo-choo mount is pretty cool. It's pretty all right. So, uh, with that, what are we getting here? We currently have in the middle... A uh, little play being made around the Dragonite still, and obviously Anna needs to get away from them now. They would have loved to jump on her, and just look at Anubarak, he really is trying to take her down. They can't get the kill though, a little bit too uncoordinated to make that happen. And at the top we already have Blaze and Sylvanas in position to start pushing for the final ball that is still in play. And they're taking it down too, so essentially we have a lot of structural damage against the red team. Blue team, the Enjoyers, they're doing their best to now set these camps up again and do what they can to push for the actual forts. <laughs> it's a bit of a trap as they're hoping for Curtis to 
to go in. It's a little bit anticlimactic, honestly, when you have like Rexa, you know, you expect like some uh, like some insane name, some like some, some, something badly, something strong, and then it's like, yeah, I'm Curtis. <laughs> Doesn't quite hit right. Uh, sorry, Curtis. But yeah. At the bottom of the map, we get a mercenary camp, so we got some uh, knights in play. They go for the hard camp here. To the day, it is funny to me that re they renamed the hard and the easy camp. So initially when Heroes of the Storm got released, it was a hard camp and an easy camp, then renamed them into the uh, uh, the siege camp and uh, all that shebang. And I'm not quite sure why exactly, I didn't they at some point, like, I don't know 100% why they did that, but I can totally see Blizzard coming, it's like, yeah, it's discriminatory towards siege giants, and we are very inclusive here, we are very protective of our siege giant community, and we didn't want to give offense, it makes it sound like they're not as good as the Bruiser camp, so yeah, the hard camp, I'm really sorry, like, yeah, we didn't want to call them out there, so we started to rename them, <laughs> that, that would be a typical Blizzard response. But yeah, they renamed everything, so Siege Giants, they were the easy camp back then. I think there was in the middle, there was another name that they had, but I can't even remember. It was all ages ago. Ford is already taken out, and I gotta say that the blue team is now doing essentially what we expected from them. They're starting to take control of all of this, and doing as, yeah, as much as they can to fully control the game and the flow of it. There is no talent advantage currently for the Enjoyers, so the FBI actually has a chance now to fight for the Dragonite, and they really should do so. We see them in the middle of the map, always attempting to set up the uh, entire play is being flanked by Nubarak, but they're losing control of the Shrines, which is a bit unfortunate. And, well, there we go. Rekt is coming in, gets attacked, and Nubarak has to dive out. There's the Riptire, and it's not gonna kill him. Highly unlikely, gets some damage done regardless though. And Falstad, with the global, has at least been able to take the Shrine down at the bottom of the map. It's actually a little bit surprising, honestly. Even with the global, they're kinda struggling here. So, it's a bit problematic for them right now. We have, at this point in time, only half a level missing until level 13 talents are going to be ready for uh, the Enjoyers. And if the FBI wants to make a play for the DK, they really need to try and make a move before that happens. But instead, it is the top lane that's in trouble. And Curtis is dead. Nice bunker play also from Blaze. And now Falstead might be in trouble. Falstead might be really in trouble. <laughs> and yes, he is suffering from a severe lack of hit points as he dies. The top four is going to get destroyed and with another Dragonite locked in for the Enjoyers. They're going to make their play there as well. Sylvanas going down though, so the FBI is fighting back. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> get wrecked! Jojo dies too. Awesome. Mephisto with the ult kill. Really well done, the FBI with another quick kill and that helps them a bit, but of course they've already suffered a lot of structure losses. All of the forts are gone, but the team is doing the best they can here currently in an attempt to stay still in the game and maybe turn it. At the top we still have a camp pushing, so over here it's the bruisers that are making their way over the bridge of death. There's still no level 13 talent for the FBI, they are still waiting for that to be part of the game so that they can maybe fight back and uh, take a proper team fight. With 11,000 damage, Mephisto is currently the top DPS for the team. 16,000 for Sylvanas on the blue team side. And another nice jet propulsion connect from Alvaros with Blaze. So, Siege Giant camp over here. They're all trying to fight for that for just a moment. But, yep, I don't think they're going to really make a play for this. Oh, the Blessed Shield bouncing off the Siege Giants. They were a bit late with an engage if they really wanted to fight for the camp. Here comes Falstad, goes straight in for Sylvanas, and she's dead. Junkrat, sorry, my bad. They nearly look alike. So, yeah, Sylvanas and Junkrat both dead, and Blaze gets murdered too. Look at that, the FBI taking no prisoners today. Yeah, a bit of a covert ops They're turning into the CIA today, as it seems. Five kills to five. And that is pretty damn good. Now they just need to do something with the numbers advantage that they just established for themselves. And they are currently trying to pull that off by going for the few remaining camps on the map. The Bruiser camp down at the bottom of the map first and foremost. So the Enjoyers, they just got clapped a little bit. He got a bit too cocky and all of a sudden, bam, straight to the face. Top side, 
Control is being retaken by Rexa, and you can see that in experience they've also caught up. They really need to do structural damage though. As long as they haven't lost the keep, it's all fine, but honestly, if your opponent still holds on to every single fort and you haven't destroyed a single one but lost all of yours, then you know that you are in trouble. So they need to really push on one of those lanes. And they haven't done any of this. Now the quest is completed for Rexa, that's definitely nice, but they need to do a little bit more here. Level 16 might change things, but they need to win an objective, they need to capitalize a little bit better on one of the team fights. I mean, something, something has to happen for them, because as time continues, they are going to run into trouble for that. But yes, either way, we now have, with level 16, the will of the Forsaken, and all up at the top, another, they're just giving it up. I honestly don't understand why they're just giving these things up so easily. The timing is just a bit off. I will chalk it up to a bit of a lack of experience in uh, the tournament life here. It's something that a lot of people just don't understand. Every time we're getting these comments that I spoke about a bit earlier, where people are saying like, Oh my god, how could they make a mistake like this? People usually just don't understand how small the margin of error in an actual tournament match is compared to what you experience in a quick match or a Storm League game. So, uh, lack of appreciation sometimes for uh, how small these windows are is uh, sometimes a bit sad. But yeah, right now you can tell that with them just not rotating in time, it gives another freebie Dragonite over to the Enjoyers. Ana gets killed, so they're taking their team fights, and Uberag is dead, and with another Fly and Gus, Coffee is attempting to set up the game for his boys. Alvaros is a bit low and has to bunker it up quickly. Might still die here. Falser was in trouble for a second, but they're still able to get the kill against Blaze. So job well done by the FBI, and now they are ahead in kills. So... Nicely done here. With that, we're now having, uh, well, not quite an experience lead for them, but at least they have a numbers advantage on the map. And they should try and use that to, I guess, sneak camp in, but there's not a whole lot that they can take. That's the biggest problem. They're fighting nice battles, but they fight them at the wrong time, which is basically what's happening there. So it's a bit unlucky. We'll see what exactly they can do as all of this continues, but this is for sure a bit of a concern here and something that they gotta fix. The fights that they are forced into are going well for them. They are coordinating them nicely and they're really capitalizing on them as best as they can, but they just need to do a little bit more when the objective is up so that they can, from a battle, go straight for a Dragonite and then start to push some structures down. Obviously, if they are still successful in these team fights, it helps them that the death times are now increasing. Maybe now a play for Sylvanas, and yes, there it is. The FBI with another kill. I like it. I mean, it's always nice to root for the underdog a bit, and we've done that in a lot of situations with the enjoyers, of course, too. But right now, I gotta say, for their first tournament experience, appearance here, the FBI is doing pretty okay. 31,000 damage for Mephisto. We got 34,000 for Junkrat. And, well, here comes the first real push for structures and also for, for Junkrat for Ether. So they're starting to take some of the structures out here. Yeah, Mephisto in particular is just starting to wreck this. One wall destroyed. Falstead still using the global to control the side lane and the experience, therefore. Yeah, and the team is still pushing. You have to be a bit careful with Blaze now moving in. Yeah, that could be a problem. Rexa gets hit. And here comes again the old from Mephisto. Trying to drop that one too, and they get another kill. Falstead flying in with another gust, going for Ana and dropping her. Damn, they are absolutely on a roll right now. Three kills. Holy shit, ladies. The FBI is starting to crush it here. 11 kills, 2 6, and they're about to hit level 20. Absolutely love it. These guys are on a tear. Yeah, they could go for a Dragonite now, decided against it. They know that the death timers are still high enough that they can make a play for the keep itself. And that is essentially what we're seeing here. There's only Jojo that can try to slow this one down, but this is pretty impressive what they're showcasing. They want to get the kill against Jojo. I don't think that's going to happen, but they can take the keep out. I'm not so sure about going for the core, on the other hand. That might be a little bit too ambitious. With 9 seconds on Ana, 3 on Junkrat, I question that choice a bit. They're gonna get damage on the core, but there is a chance they're gonna get wiped here. This might work, it might not. If it doesn't work, then they're really in trouble. But they're getting the core down to 60%. Here comes the wind tunnel, 40%. Are they able to pull it off? Looks good. 30. Yeah, this is looking really good for them. Nicely done. 
The call to go for core and the FBI takes the lead in the best of three. Before we head into game number two, make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet so you don't miss out on any future content here on Calder TV. Okay, the FBI has done it. They took game number one and are now leading in the best of three series against the Enjoyers as we are going for Infernal Shrines. I gotta say I like it. I like it a lot. They come in here for the first time in one of the tournaments and they immediately are starting to shake things up. Now the Enjoyers obviously can still win the series by winning two in a row now, but currently they're one map loss away from being kicked out of qualifier number one. We're going to Infernal Shrines and Vala gets banned. I am highly intrigued to see what we're going to get, not only as picks, but also in regards to the decision making. You could tell that at least at the beginning, the Enjoyers were absolutely running the show. They got three Dragonites, I believe, and they got their kills very early, dominated the game. And then all of a sudden, the FBI started, you know, to be a little bit more diligent about those team fights, and they were able to pull it off. Some nice falls that flies also with gusts, so that was pretty uh, well done. But I like it. <laughs> I like it a lot. It's not really what I expected. But I always love it when we have a new team coming in uh, doing well. And again, this could be you guys. So if you have a couple of friends and you want to play in the tournament, keep in mind that we have multiple of these happening before we're heading into the playoffs. Six in total. So you can participate in the qualifiers. I've been highlighting it a few times now already. You can either go to Twitter, you can go to Discord, or we're also announcing all of this on Reddit. So all three platforms are totally fine. You can find links in the description if you're interested. Every now and then there's somebody jumping into the comments and asking me like, hey, how can I participate in these tournaments? Nearly all of them are free to sign up. So you can just get some friends together and form a team and join up for that. So, or if you don't have any friends, you can pay some people or whatnot. Like, I don't know. Zara Tool banned, Hoga also banned, and off we go. We got the right winger as our first pick, and we get Diablo Tychus. We talked about Tychus actually yesterday. The Tychus has fallen off very heavily. Even in Meta Madness, most teams didn't want to pick him. Now we get him together with Diablo in the 1 2 rotation. So at least the FBI is still valuing him. And this is obviously a decent map for him, just simply because you can use Odin during the Shrine fights. But even on Infernal Shrines, Tychus is not being picked anymore by most of the top teams. So there's that. Garrosh and Leoric has a bit of a counter as well. And well, let's see what we're going to get as our final bans over here. I'm a bit surprised that we didn't get the Haka. The Haka would have been a pretty nice side laner here too. We could still get it for the FBI, of course, but they decided in favor of Leoric instead. Tracer's getting banned. And also, what are our damage dealers going to be for the Enjoyers? I think I'm a little bit spoiled after yesterday. With Murgy, Choker, and everything being played. I'm now looking at this and I was like, okay, where's my Nova pick? <laughs> Why has nobody chosen Nova yet? <laughs> it's not quite that bad, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious if we're going to see a little bit more of that later today. And when it's banned, I'm always here for that. And what's going to happen on the side lane for the FBI now? Dehaka! There he is! Alright, okay. One team at least is picking Dehaka. He has the, uh, the Mecha Dehaka skin though. I kind of hate that skin. It's so bad. It's really not good. The Haka honestly doesn't have a whole lot of good skins. The only one that I can see is the skin tint variation where he's like pink. Isn't that one that is yellow? Those are kind of okay. Um, I think this one is actually not the makeup one. It's the, the, the toy skin or whatever it is. But yeah, the Haka doesn't have a whole lot of good skins. He has like one. One that's decent. That's about it. Or oh, am I blanking? Nah. <laughs> we need a new Liming skin. Kappa. Chromie and Greymane. Alright. Chromie and Greymane. And the final pick now for the FBI. Again, if they win it here, they move on to the next round of the tournament and kick the Enjoyers out. Which would be a bit of an upset, to be absolutely honest with you. So let's see if the Enjoyers can turn this one around and put a point on the board for game number three. Or if the ABI, FBI is now taking a glorious victory as they lock in Hanzo as the final pick for the second map in the best of three series. 
Game number two, the Enjoyers on the left side of the map with Lavakal on Brightwing, Ether on Greymane, we have Alvaros on Chromie, Arion on Garrosh, and Rechu is playing Leoric. Over to the right side of the map, the FBI with Kurt. And first of all, they are in the lead again. We have Curtis on the Haka, we got Lanka on Rega. Rectinoob on Diablo, Sereni on Hanzo, and Coffee is playing Tychus. Okay, let's go. Can they go for the 2 0 victory? Oh, that's a shitty mount. Horrible mount. And we have an auto attack build for uh, Mr. Coffee. Press the advantage on level 1. Okay, most likely gonna be in the rhythm. As is level 4 talent, and level 7 we could see... I mean, there's a couple of different choices that we could see on uh, level 7. It depends all a bit on how serious they are about this attack build. But, yep, not going for grenades here. Still starting to build it up a bit with the trade, but after level 4, I would assume that we're going to see him stack up a lot more during these fights. And then he is going to rely on uh, the front line to CC and drag a couple of targets into all of this. Hans are already jumping out here. The Haga is already up at the top. Again, this skin, I really don't like it. I think a lot of these toy skins are pretty garbage. The Stitcher skin also is something that I really don't like. The mecha skins for the Haka are, in my opinion, the only ones that are worth mentioning. There's like so many shitty skins in the game. There's some that are absolutely amazing, but some of them are a bit meh. It's honestly pretty sad when they brought the master skins in. Most master skins are just trash. I think the Vala skin is kind of okay and the one for Teriel too, but most of the master skins are just like so bad. And back then it was always like, oh my god, I have to play so long to actually unlock all of these things. And they were just like, yeah, mid at best. It was always a bit of a sad moment, but yeah, either way. So, with that said and done, we now have the Enjoyers desperately trying to uh, bring this series back. They're going for Diablo, and well, Rectinoop is apparently trying to justify his nickname. Uh, what? <laughs> 15 hit points, and he gets away. <laughs> and Richo really wanted that kill and is now activating his trade because he went a little bit too deep. Baited, baby! So, yeah. Absolutely baited. He's down and that is first blood for the FBI. Now, level 4 is starting to kick in. The Enjoyers, they grab it first. That is a very early camp. Damn. I am actually very surprised that they're taking this mercenary camp this early because the shrine spawns at the bottom of the map. If it was a top shrine, I would maybe understand it, but this seems very, very early for them. So, yeah, they grab it already. Actually, like, I'm apparently, like, guys, I, I, I swear to God, I only had a single cup of coffee. I was just like looking at this and I was like, oh my god, this is so early. And then they take the camp and 2.30 hits and the objective gets announced. I still think it's maybe a tad too early, but it's like not nearly as bad as I thought. In my head, for some reason, we were still two minutes away from objective number one. <laughs> yeah, I, I swear to god, I didn't smoke anything. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> the second I looked at it, I was like, oh wait, we're at 2.30. Why did I think it was still two minutes for the objective? <laughs> oh boy, okay. If the day starts like this, then yeah, I don't want to know what I'm going to say in uh, the final game there. So, yeah. But okay. One kill to zero. We still have the objective up. Time to shine. Time to go. Who's going to get the first Punisher? The camps at the top already taken out. Both of them. There's still one in the middle of the map. The red team has set up. They are now on 15 stacks. Pretty much identical to what the Enjoyers are running. And they are still trying to get those hits in. We have, by the way, got Master Assassin. So it's a bit of a weird combo what we're getting from uh, Coffee here. Normally when you get an auto attack build, you're going for in the rhythm. But in this case, yeah, it's decided to still go for Master Assassin, which is fairly typical for a Tychus build. Just that combo in particular is not something that I see a whole lot. If you're going for press the advantage, one of the main reasons that you're doing this is normally that you're trying to get more stacks for in the rhythm. You want to make your life a little bit easier there. And you can, of course, then also dish out damage from uh, a safer distance. But this is a wild combo that we're seeing from him. So the first objective is taken and immediately baited over the wall for a bit of an easier defense. Oh, Arian, careful. Diablo is also, like, toying with fire the entire time. He was already close to dying earlier, but here he is once again at a third of his hit points. Triple stun by the Punisher! <laughs> Damn! 
Now, the Punisher is still keeping everybody busy and zoning them away from the fort, which means that it's an easy first structure to be destroyed by the Enjoyers. So they take the lead here fairly significantly. Job well done by them. And now we are getting even the Relentless Soldier as the level 7 talent. So, okay. So far, so good. I mean, the main reason, obviously, that you're going for a Master Assassin is that you're trying to get the passive for Odin. Sometimes we see the quest completed, but it doesn't traditionally happen. I'm still very surprised that we have that as a level 4 choice. It's not the typical play that you would go for if you're trying to go into an auto attack style, which he clearly indicated he would do with press the advantage as level 1. But be that as, as it may, this is a map where Odin shines, you want to have the passive for your level 10, so it at least makes sense, just not quite in the context of the build itself. Level 10 is now already in for Chromie, so we now got Slowing Sands in the house. And yeah, still only a single kill in this game. We're already five and a half minutes in. Only one kill. And everybody working on the level 10 abilities. As up at the top, there's the next push. Curtis. <laughs> His name is just funny to me. <laughs> oh, Curtis. <laughs> it's like somebody coming in is calling himself Fred. Can you like imagine a team where everybody is just like naming their account with their first name? It's really weird. Like in esports, everybody has a nickname. No, most people don't have their real name. There's obviously a few that do that, but they are few and far between. But it would be kind of just like really funny if you had some, uh, you know, like entire team where everybody has just like a run of the mill, super generic game. John, Curtis, Bob, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> would make for a fantastic team, honestly. <laughs> so, yeah. And Tomb is in. One team has level 10, the other one doesn't. That means that we have an immediate kill. Tigers goes down, and he's not the only one. Bye bye, Hanzo. He's also eliminated, and now they're trying to follow that up with another one. But Ancestral is ready for Diablo. He might even get away. Dimas is insanely resilient here. He hasn't died yet. He was three times super close, but every time he got saved or somehow bullied his way out of the battle, still with two kills for uh, the enjoyers they were able to take another fort down and that is the second one that got now destroyed so yeah well done i mean the enjoyers are clearly uh, getting a little bit angry after game number one they were sitting there thinking hey this can't be happening we can't just be losing to a team that has very little experience in the competitive scene here in the tournament scene especially not after the performance that we showed in the winner bracket so let's just Buckle up a little bit, look at game number one as a bit of a warm-up game, and then start dominating here. And so far, they've done exactly that. They do not have a talent advantage, though. They are running a one-level lead over the opponent's team, but they don't have a talent advantage. And with that, we're heading straight into the next fight. The Haka up against Brightwing. Another Entomb against Tigers. Yeah, can still use Odin for that fight, but they're falling a bit behind in points on the objective. So, yeah, Tychus is insanely low, has to be really careful, is using his range at least for now, and Dehaka is obviously here too, but Diablo finally dies, Dehaka is on the run, seems like he doesn't have any essence left either, gets a quick heal from Rega, but they're getting all zoned away from the shrine, the blue team has taken full control over it, and the enjoyers will grab themselves another Punisher. This time it's going to be a Mortar Punisher that they're going to use. With three kills to one, they are clearly in the driver's seat for map number two in this series. So down at the bottom of the map, we have still yeah, Brightwing trying to get some extra XP for them. They have that experience lead now. And we're already talking keeps here. We're not even 10 minutes into the game. But we're talking about keeps at this point as we see the enjoyers pushing in trying to destroy that wall it's a bit unlikely that they're going to get more than the wall it would be a shocker if that keep would actually fall here the only way they can make that happen is by killing a few heroes then again they got Greymane, and Greymane is always amazing on this i mean see just how he's chunking this down and the punisher hasn't been defeated either they're actually getting it this is nuts 10 minutes in two forts and a keep destroyed damn talking about elite that is bonkers that's huge. Two kills to zero. Uh, sorry, uh, two levels ahead, three kills to one. And all the structures destroyed here. It's wild. It's really wild. The only one that died so far is Leoki. Richu has died uh, one time. 
I mean, at this point, he owns the rest of the team, uh, keg of B, I'd say. If he's the only one that dies in all of this, then yeah, definitely, bad lost. But okay, down at the bottom of the map, what we're getting is another camp locked in. Obviously, they're currently dominating the map here and are ruling it with an iron fist. They are, I mean, they're like, going to pick up level 16 before the next objective. This is real problematic for the FBI. Yeah. Top lane is the only lane where they're still holding a fort, the only lane where they still have a fountain. But the problem is simply that they are very, very likely going to run up against an opponent that has a talent advantage over them. Yeah, it seems like the problems for the blue team are also still going on. So we have Garrosh in this case dropping out of the game. We already had the same problem happening yesterday. Apparently Polish internet these days is pretty trash. I always thought that German internet was absolutely garbage. But Poland is apparently trying to give us a run for their money. So we'll see. I'm still fairly happy with my internet over here in Spain. Fast and cheap. That's how I like it. So, two levels ahead. We have at the same time in uh, regards to talents, Tyke is now with a Neo Steel coding. Again, taking the Master Assassin obviously for uh, the passive increase here and trying to use that with Odin during the shrine fights, which so far hasn't really worked a whole lot for him. But they are attempting to get some extra XP currently, doing their best down at the bottom of the map, I suppose, to lock some of these uh, yeah, camps in, get also the minion waves here. But it's not going to be easy. They got the Haka, who can sit at the side and give them some extra experience, but I don't think they can catch up quickly enough to get level 16 by the time that the next objective is on the map. And once that this one is lost, it's going to likely spell out the end of the fort here, always assuming that the blue team is actually successful in grabbing it. Because not only would they have that talent advantage, but in addition to that, we're also talking about a Frozen Punisher coming up next, and that is by far the strongest out of the three. So, yeah. That is not going to make it any easier for the FBI. So their best chance essentially is to somehow get some kills. This is always easier said than done. You have to try and somehow sneak up on an opponent, gank somebody, maybe Brightwing at the bottom of the map. Currently they're just coming towards the top, trying to defend their fort. But the situation is still more or less the same. We have catapults amassing in the middle together with a mercenary camp on top of that. That will easily be defended, or at least I would assume so. But with a two-level advantage for the Enjoyers, it's quite clear that the blue team is going to reign supreme on that next objective. Mithril Mace is in. The question at the end of the day is honestly just simply if the FBI is willing to fight against an opponent that has a talent advantage. Arrow, nice! But they needed a follow-up on this and they just couldn't get it. Brightwing came into saving the day here. The arrow was actually pretty nice, but they needed a follow-up. Now Odin is being baited out. Okay, it's going to be a 5 versus 5 with a talent lead for the blue team and a 2-level advantage, which is going to give them an additional stats boot, of course. So currently, the Haka moving away here. Diablo might get caught. Still don't want to fight into Odin, but it's also going to run out fairly quickly. But that also means that all of these ults, all of these cooldowns are not going to be available anymore for the battle for the shrine. So I don't think that the red team is even going to try. They're most likely just going to jump back on that. I mean, in the middle of the map, the Haka, he has to defeat against this and whoof! They caught Diablo after all. All right, Dibbles is down and so is the Ford. That makes this entire top lane even more vulnerable. Not only is the Shrine likely going to be claimed by the blue team, but they're also stealing away the Shaman camp. Yeah, this is not good news. Not at all for the FBI. The Enjoyers are looking just a little bit too strong on the map number two. 30,000 damage for Chromie. Everybody is starting to move in, or at least damage dealers are moving in for the Shrine. And the rest of the team is still doing the best they can on those lanes, locking some extra experience in. At the top, Leo's just keeping an open eye on what's going on there. If maybe somebody rotates over, obviously, they see the Haka at the bot lane. At the bot lane, that's what the minimap is for at the end of the day. And that top lane push could result in a second keep getting destroyed. Now, the only good news, and there is very little to be had for the red team, but the only good news that they really do have is that level 16 is now available. So for their top lane defense, they will have even talents with the Enjoyers. That's the good news. 
The quest is now completed for, well, not the quest, but like the builds completed for Rega pretty much with the Earthgrass totem. All the synergies unlocked with uh, the totem build. We're also looking at debilitating flames for Diablo and Tychus went into sizzling attacks. Yeah, it's party time. They need to bait over the Punisher, which they've already done. Side wall is opened up, so now they are starting to be vulnerable here. The Harker sitting at the side, hoping to flank in, but by the time that he arrives, Ancestral is already gone, and I think Diablo is also dead. Very low, gets rooted. The arrow slows it down just a little bit. A nice save by Garrosh as Leo was close to dying. Bright being not so lucky, so the fruit fly is dead. And Tychus is able to also hammer Leoric. But it doesn't change the fact that that top keep is still in danger. The Punisher is attacking. Catapults are here too. And with the three versus four, the blue team is still willing to linger around a bit longer. But the red team saves it. The FBI is able to save their topside keep. Barely, but they do. This should be picked up quickly, but this is still a bit of a win for them. At least for the time being, no more catapult pressure at the top lane. So that is something. They're still two levels behind. Level 20 is getting closer and closer. We have 34,000 damage now for Hanzo and 37,000 for Chromie. Let's not forget how the first game went. There was the late game where the FBI really was shining. But this is just bad. This can't happen. You can't, this was them allowing this for free, even if Diablo, uh, sorry, Leori gets killed here. Yeah, I mean, who cares? So, yeah, that keep gone. That's unnecessary. It really was. Brightwing at least is about to get killed. I don't even understand why Brightwing went in there in the first place. I would have just let Leo die. That's what he's there for. <laughs> have you seen his trade? He's not even dying. He's just activating his trade. He's getting good use out of all the abilities that you have. Allows the FBI to get a bit closer. But it's still a one and a half level gap between the two. And now we get level 20 for the Enjoyers. The next objective down at the bottom of the map. So pretty much the only lane where the FBI still holds on to a key. So, yeah. Two heroes down for the blue team. Definitely avoidable. Uh, invade at the top. Barbecue play from Diablo as he goes for the lightning breath. But with level 20 talents in their hands, the only reason why they're not fighting here is that, well, it's Brightwing and uh, Leo that we're missing. The camp was already taken though, so yep, that's not a problem. And they gotta deal with this too. Just imagine if just this entire this entire lane comes in and the catapult 15, 16 minutes in starts damaging the actual keep. Tyke is getting caught at the top. Hello, what are you doing there? Tyke is alone, irgendwo, irgendwo. Out there in bumfuck nowhere. So, yep, that's a kill. And that is bad news. Half a level until 20 for the FBI. Half a level until 20. They should be able to get that for the objective, but it doesn't change the fact that they haven't destroyed a single fort and they lost all their forts and two keeps. Catapults are going to wreck them. The objective is at the bottom of the map, so it means two lanes are going to be pushing against the core. If you don't push this out early, if you don't the Haka for a long time on that side lane, you're going to be in trouble. And they are now going down to the bottom of the map, trying to take another uh, tower down here. They are hitting the red team over and over again, and they're forcing them back. And thus far, the FBI doesn't have level 20. So Greyman, he's again wrecking it. Greyman is amazing on structures. I mean, look at this damage. The catapult, yes, does a lot, but Greyman and Chromie, they're crushing this one easily. And this means all of the keeps are now gone. The only thing the enjoyers have to do now is play it slow. Play it slow. Just drag it out. Let the catapults get towards the core and let the Winions claim victory. That's all that they gotta do. Don't take quick and dirty fights. Just play a slow game. Look at the minimap. Look at the top lane. Look at the bot lane. Look at the mid lane. There's just catapults everywhere. The only potential victory for the FBI comes from quick and decisive fights where they get kills. And that's what they're trying to go for. And they can't get them right now. There's catapults already on the core, working on the shield a little bit. Minion waves will defeat some of them. But more and more are coming. And eventually, they are going to be out of luck. A fountain is still there for the enjoyers. They can easily grab those. And yes, the red team is under pressure. Under attack. And they struggle here, but they're still trying to fight. They're still trying to take the team fight here. They're going for a kill. They can't take Leoric down yet. They're going for Garrosh instead, trying to drop him. Arian is low, and he still survives. 
still survives and Tychus is gone, so is Diablo, the Haka falls, it's the triple baby. They're taking three heroes down and it's bad, bad news for the FBI. They're losing Hanzo and now it's Rega, the only survivor that's on the run. Even he might not survive this. Greyman wants him and Greyman is gonna get him. That's a kill and that's a wrap. It is a tie in the best of three series as we have the enjoyers claiming victory on Inferno Shrines and we are off heading into game number three of this loser's bracket match at qualifier number one. Final map in the best of three series here in the loser's bracket of the first qualifier for the Banshee Cup. And it is Alterac Pass. 20 heroes are unavailable. Again, every hero can only be played once within a series. Fairly simple reason. We just want to make sure that heroes are not being played in every single game, every single map. So this mixes it up a little bit, but there's obviously not that craziness that comes with actual Meta Madness rules where we have pre-bans, just as a comparison for the uh, Meta Madness tournament that we just ran, we had 22 pre-bans, so a uh, lot more crazy. But either way, at this point, the FBI needs to have, of course, a bit of a different approach. The last game didn't work out for them at all. They got absolutely dominated here. The enjoyers, they found their flow. They had the answer and they were always able to get their, their kills. So right now, Zeratul gets banned with Alderic Pass. I mean, I'm thinking a bit about what kind of globals we still have available. There's not all that much that comes to mind. You could technically <laughs> try to play some Vikings here, yeah, I suppose. Samuro is still up and he might be a decent choice for the map. Falls and Nehaka have already been played, both of them. Inubrak has also been played in game number one, so he is a very popular hero since you can uh, just cheese, you can sneak the the prisoner camp very easily. Now you can do that with a few other heroes as well, but Inubrak is by far the most popular out of all of them. And Lucio getting banned doesn't come as a shock either, considering that he really empowers those quick rotations. Hogger, of course, another strong one. So they're getting rid of some of the favorites very, very quickly. But, yeah, personally, really curious if we're going to see some uh, interesting picks on the side of the Enjoyers. Or who knows, maybe even on the side of the FBI. Could also get... Oh, Hammer. Yeah, Hammer is actually getting quite popular here again. We haven't seen her in Meta Madness and she was very quickly one of the pre-bans. But we have now seen her in the qualifier for the Banshee Cup multiple times. I think she's been played in nearly every single series. And most of them even in uh, game number one. Muradin and Li Ming. So Alvaro's going to be looking to throw out some combos with Li Ming and uh, trying to get that burst damage connected for quick resets, of course, too. So what are we getting on on top of that? With Sergeant Hammer, you're, of course, going to try and adopt your build there a little bit. Protect the hammer. Make that happen. You even get a Tyriel here at some point if they want to go all out on that. And there it is. Tyriel gets played together with Tracer. So now we got a couple of reasons why they're going for it. We have, first of all, Tyriel for Sanctification that he can drop. Tracer also benefiting from the shield. If you're going for the standard support with this, you would look at Malfurion and try and claim him. That assumes, of course, that the Enjoyers neither ban nor pick him for themselves. But the Holy Trinity for Tracer players was always Malfurion, Tyriel, and Tracer. You get the shield from Tyriel, you get all the other benefits that the hero brings, and from Malfurion you get that overheal that allows you to just dive a little bit deeper into the opponent's team and really try to go for aggressive plays, get some damage connected, maybe come in for that quick kill before you recall back out. White main instead gets banned. She's, of course, a bit more in the Sergeant Hammer camp, but you're trying to do that. One hero that has been missing a bit is Medivh. Haven't seen Medivh yet. I think eventually it's going to be played. In this qualifier, we haven't seen the Swedish team play yet. We haven't seen them. They were signed up, but apparently they couldn't make it this weekend. But Make is playing again, and Swam Kurota is on the same team. So there is a chance that we're going to get Medivh from them eventually. And, of course, there's also Ultralisk. Nano could play too. So there's multiple teams currently signed up for these qualifiers where we could see Medivh being played. And I guess eventually he's going to make an appearance. Over here we got Uther. And Samora is unfortunately banned. Uther and Urel. 
So you got Muradin as your main tank, Gurel as your side laner, Lavakal with Uther, and yeah, I want to see what Arian is going to pick. It's kind of sad to me personally that we don't have Darkmog, for example, signed up for any of the teams. He might sub in at some point, but I already know that they would be thinking about playing Illidan here if Darkmog was actually playing. Go for the hunt, use it as a pseudo global, and just jump across the map with it. But for the FBI, the final two picks, we're getting. Uh, Malthael and Malfurion. As I said, if Malfurion isn't banned or picked by the blue team, then the chances that the FBI is playing him are very, very high with that lineup. Genji, so we could get Dragon Blade with the Divine Shield, and that sets us up for game number three, the final map in the best of three series here at the Banshee Cup qualifier. Let's go. Final map, game number three. On the left side, Arion with Genji, Ether on Yorel. Alvaros is playing Liming, we got Lavakal on Utha, and Richu is playing Muradin. To the right side of the map, the FBI, victorious in game number one. We have them with uh, Sereni on uh, Tracer, Coffee on Sergeant Hammer, Lolanka on Malfurion. I actually don't know if that's Lolanka or Ayolanka. I like the Lola thing. We're going for Lolanka. And Rectinoob is playing Teriel with Curtis on uh, Malfael, the Angel of Death. Ho, ho, ho. And on level 1, once again, the Advanced Artillery right here. So it is hammer time. Muradin can throw a couple out. And on top of that, we also have the Sergeant. <laughs> Coffee is already sitting tight. And is missing half of his hit points instantly because Li Ming had the easiest shot of her life. Could jump in and just take this one out. Tracer rounds on level 1 for Tracer. And we get the Emerald Dreams for Malfuria. And of course, as usual. So far, so good. Uh, Hello. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tracer getting soloed in the middle by Genji. Good for Genji. Bit unexpected, honestly. Didn't see that coming. So, yes, nicely done. Genji gets a very quick kill against Tracer. The FBI is in trouble. And at the bottom of the map, they're trying to set up a Siege Sergeant Hammer to start damaging some structures, which thus far hasn't worked out for them. But the night is young. So let's see if they can still pull that one off. Camp obviously is up and one of the most important things when you're playing on all drag passes is to try and grab this one as quickly as you can every single time that it's available. Got to be diligent around that and it is going to reward you well if you do it and your opponent doesn't. But both teams are active on this. Genji trying to also come in here to maybe capitalize on a low HP hero. But he's slightly too late. The camp has already been taken so nothing that they can really do about this. And all the way up to the top, uh, Sereni gets pushed back. As in the middle of the map, we're still having Sergeant Hammer trying her luck now on a different lane. So yeah, trying to do her thing. Obviously, very, very annoying trying to push into Sergeant Hammer, but that's what Liming is for at the end of the day. You want to try and connect some of that burst damage and some of those abilities. And if you then also have Urel that can uh, cause a bit of displacement, even better. So yes, nicely done. Tracer Bomb is missing, but a really good attack again from the Enjoyers as we now have Siege Tactics in the house. And that's going to be a pretty important talent for Sergeant Hammer considering uh, what she's up against there on the other side. For Malthale, we get the Throwing Shade, which always makes me kind of assume that Malthale is actually German. The Germans are amazing at Throwing Shade. They're really good at that. So, yeah. And also, Malthale, you know, he's like the guy that's like no humor. Like, yeah, I don't know. I always like think Malthale and particularly Imperius are German. Imperius clearly has a stick up his ass and the way that he's striding across the battlefield always makes him sound like a mid-level bureaucrat or something. So he gives me, uh, you know, all of those discipline and the rules vibes. So yeah, Imperius and Malthale are my two top candidates when it comes to, uh, to German heritage and any of the Heroes of the Storm heroes. So yeah, it is what it is. But now that we have the next camp being taken, Curtis is doing his thing. I can't get away from the name. I don't know why it's funny. I know that everybody thinks it's stupid and is like, dude, color, just, just, just shut up about it. But every time I jump anywhere onto a lane where Curtis is doing his thing, I gotta laugh a little bit. I'm starting to grin. I don't know why. But yeah, uh, you jump across the map and you see Death Knight. You see... Uh, Sereni over here, you see, uh, and then you go to the next one, you see Curtis. 
<laughs> it's just too good. It's too good. Uh, it's great. I like it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big Curtis fan. But yeah, still, makes me smile. Level 7 is in. So that gives us the next talent. And we got again the Divine Steed. We also have Calamity. It is party time. Let's go and commit. Li Ming wants some action. And yeah, also some real nice connects here against Tyrael, who definitely didn't like that and lost more than half of his hit point pool. At the top, big 1v1 still. Tracer zipping around, buzzing around everyone. Bzz, bzz, trying to get some damage in. And look at that. They're going to get a free objective, as it seems. At least they're getting dangerously close to locking the first one in. They moved on to the camp. Tracer is trying to interrupt that long enough. I don't really think this is going to happen. They're going to take it. Yep. Prisoners are being freed. And that means the cavalry is going to enter the game. First objective should open some walls up. Don't think that there's an actual fort that gets destroyed. But I would be surprised if these walls don't get opened up. At least at the bottom and at the top lane. Middle it already has happened earlier. Maybe there some damage against the fort is unavoidable, but every bells, yeah. Skullcracker is in, and now with the reverberation as the level 4 choice, we could should see Bronze be at Rage as the level 13 talent for Muradin. And again, talking Muradin, he's immediately jumping in. Quick Storm Bolt against Sergeant Hammer, and Alvarus is just ready for one combo after another. Coming in with those hits and yes, doing a fantastic job of keeping them low and pushing them back. And it results in Tyrael nearly dying here. Good job by Recti Noob to actually stay alive and Malfurate obviously healing all that out. But it forces them back and that creates more space and time for the objective to do damage against the fort. Whereas down at the bottom of the map, easy defense by Tracer. And at the top, not that much has happened either, so I gotta give it to the FBI. They defended this extremely well. They took some damage in the middle of the map, but the Raiders on the top and bot lane did do pretty much nothing. Highly unsuccessful. The wall still stands. And, yeah. Uh, there it is. Level 10, now ready any moment. Again, we would suspect Divine Shield and Dragon Blade would be a cool combo. Genji has played a lot of X-Strike lately, obviously, and there it is again. I personally really like the old-school HTC combo. Usually, I mean, you use two ults and you have to really get value out of it. It was awesome to see it on the first day of this uh, first qualifier in the winner bracket where it was actually played, but we get X-Strike, we get the Divine Shield, so no Dragon Blade combo with the heroes that they have here. Yeah, Alvaro is super low after he just got attacked, but they get him out of the fight. The blue team is, generally speaking, pretty low. They went, of course, with Li Ming and Genji for a bit of an old-school comp, where the two of them are trying to go for full resets. We've seen that in the days of HTC and ever since. But can they get those resets? Can they make those plays? Kofi is ready. They're trying again for Tyriel. Okay. Tyriel has to be careful. Curtis comes in and tries to assist just a bit. Still waiting for last right. Curtis! And the Divine Shield ruins the play. Sergeant Emma dies instead. Sanctification is already out with another Stormbolt. Tracer is in trouble too. Is able to zip away, but could still be killed if Genji is getting his cooldown back in time. And yeah, there we have it. The kill against Tracer. Another quick combo. Nicely done. And that is three kills to zero now for the Enjoyers. Yeah, they're pulling it off again. The early game is theirs. FBI was always a bit stronger in the mid and the late game, I guess. But this is a one level lead and they have three kills to zero. The next objective is up and could theoretically be taken. There's also a couple of bosses. There's a few camps that they can still take. Which is essentially what we would expect from them. We have 18,000 damage from Sergeant Hammer. And 25,000 from Li Ming. So, Li Ming running the show. So many combos are being set up for her by Murden with a stun, follow-ups from Uther, even Urel coming in and pushing people around, so there's quite a lot. But in the meantime, move in the middle of the map. Uh, Sergeant Hammer is now attempting to leverage Napalm as a level 1 talent to get more siege damage done. With Genji moving towards the middle, they still gotta be a bit careful on this one. So, yeah, comes in, gets some damage at least connected. But it's not enough. As expected, Bronze Bit Rage and 13 for Murden. 
And we now have also Illusionist. Another Stormbolt connects. Yeah, but they can't really threaten a kill here. They can definitely do that at the top, though. Curtis is in trouble. Curtis! And he's down. Curtis dies. And that is kill number four. So again, the enjoyers, they're building up that momentum. They're trying to start with a bit of a snowball here and turn that into a massive avalanche. And currently it's working. They have uh, had a talent lead. Can now rely on a numbers advantage. And even with Tracer going down into the back line and attempting to go for a kill against Liming gets thwarted quickly as Uther releases another Divine Shield to save the day. So these little pokes that we're seeing from the red team are not working just yet. Malthael has still not gotten a single kill and single stack for his last rides. And the entire team hasn't gotten a kill. So the entire team has not gotten a single kill thus far. But no fort has fallen yet either. Genji still starting to sniff this out. Do a bit of damage here. It's actually a little bit surprising to me that the enjoyers at no point were interested in going for objective number two. I think they had a chance to get a big lead on it. But yeah. But interested as it seems. So right now we have still a one level lead. Ford in the mid lane is a bit low. For the top lane also has taken some damage. At the same time though, with level 13, we now got the inevitable end. And we get jumper. Yeah, Tracer was always a little bit jumpy. Looked very jumpy here. Didn't really help her though so far though. Maybe now in the middle, finally a chance to go for some damage. Now, if Malf Malfurion went into Twilight Dream, so we don't get Tranquility for extra sustain. They have the Sanctification from Tyrael, but that's about it. So if they can do something there, that would of course be pretty neat. Just imagine them going in and landing a proper Twilight Dream and then building on that. But instead, we now have the attack again. Sergeant Hammer, and that is the end. Curtis unleashes another last ride, but Murden is just shrugging it off and doesn't care about it. And now Malthael, trying to retreat here, is in trouble. He's dead too. That's two heroes eliminated. And the map is wide open for the Enjoyers. They want to take the W here. They want to move on to the next round of the loser's bracket. The push in the middle of the map is already happening as Genji is pushing a camp and the minion wave over. We have them going for the objective. Even the bot lane is getting attacked here. And it's happening. The first fort is already gone. And down at the bottom of the map, we are getting even more action going now as they're trying to go for Tracer. They got level 16 too. That means that we are looking at Mirror Ball, Sanctification, imposing presences in for Muradin. And yeah, this is not looking great for the FBI. They're losing too many structures already without the cavalry even being on the map. But it's of course undeniable that there will be another objective for the enjoyers. They get it right here, right now. And well, how much is the red team going to lose? They're going to lose this bottom fort probably before the cavalry is even here. At the top we have Urel now all alone. Seems like the red team is just desperately trying to get a kill with a numbers advantage. Forcing that fight in a 5 versus 4. Urel is moving over though. And nothing has happened down here. No kill and the cavalry is on the way. This is bad news and the situation is still the same. The destroyers, uh, the, <laughs> the destroyers, the enjoyers. They have level 16. Muradin just throwing out zoning storm balls at this point. A lot of this is not connecting, but the uh, Twilight Dream from Malfurion also is of absolutely no consequence. Avatar is being forced out. Top Ford is going to fall to the cavalry, but they're starting to attack here. They're coming in once again. Sanctification is out to save the day for the red team, but they're really struggling. They're trying to force them back as best as they can, but they have a huge uh, amount of problems at the top lane where another fort is going to be lost down at the bottom of the map the poke is still happening there's a cavalry in the middle this is only objective number two so still easily defended and hasn't scaled properly but yeah six kills to zero it tells the tale as long as all the keeps are still in play it's fine but at this point it just seems like it's a it's a matter of time. Just a matter of time until they're losing it more. Mechanical know-how on level 16. So not going into Giant Killer or any shenanigans like that against the front line. Smite the Wicked for Tyriel and Malfurion still making his choice too. But there's a boss about to be taken at the bottom of the map. The red team is responding by moving towards the top lane and starting to do their thing. 
I mean, if they push this out, look at how much time is needed for the red team in order to get this boss. They can't just simply move back. And the longer they need to take the boss, the more time for the blue team to go down to the bot lane and go for keep. So yes, they get the boss, but they're now super late defending the bottom of the map. And this means that this full keep is going to go down. That's the first armor shield removed 100% from the boss here on all direct pass. And that is just problematic. Yeah. Already gone. First armor shield, as you can see, is removed. Normally, you don't go for the core until two are removed. They can even defend at the top lane if they wanted. But this rotation was just a bit too slow. And I think this is the general theme a bit in some of the games that we've seen now from the FBI. That some of the rotations are just not crisp enough. And that comes with experience. The more tournament experience that you have, the easier you're going to be able to get used to that and make those proper rotations. But they were just not fast enough going for the boss at the top lane. And that resulted in them now losing their bottom keep, whereas the top fort is still standing. So, yeah. There we go. They're trying to leverage Sergeant Hammer a little bit more. Trying to push through the middle, trying to protect her, set her up for a victory and force the opponent to push into her, which so far has, I mean, partially worked, but <laughs> they are the ones being chased across the map. And look at the damage output. Li Ming and Sergeant Hammer basically drawing even here, with Sergeant Hammer now starting to take the lead. But not a single kill, not one, for the FBI. Not a single one. So, there's a level missing until 20. And the next objective is also up on the map. Nice connect on Tyriel. But Uther! Oh, Divine Shield on Uther! Sanctification from Tyriel. Both teams going for their passive moves now. Another good connect from Liming with the next combo. Trying to surpass Sergeant Hammer again and able to pull it off. But the fort in the middle is likely going to fall now. So a bit of success for the FBI as they're starting to do structural damage. Last right! And X-Strike dodges it. Cooldown for cooldown between the two teams. And we have Urel coming in, nearly taking Curtis down. Wrecked Inoop was also dropping low, but now we are finally getting some real action from the red team. And the usual problem on the side of the Enjoyers. Who's dropping this time? Actually, at this point, it doesn't seem like anybody dropped. They had so many problems. The Polish team really struggling. We had two players that were struggling with their internet connection. Right now, it seems that at least nobody dropped, so I assume that it's only Lex that we're talking about. But in this mid-fight, that fort is still standing, but I gotta give some credit still to the FBI. They were very, very aggressive and diligent about these moves. One of the reasons why they're falling back now is simply that level 20 that is coming in. And you can see the experience gap between the teams. I mean, 4,000 experience coming from the fact alone that we are having not a single kill for the FBI. So that already is a problem. We have the objective back up, push against the core, but this bad boy always regenerates hit points. So there's no real way that it's being taken down by Winions alone, even with the top lane pushing. There needs to be another keep that gets destroyed first before these lanes become in any way, shape or form dangerous. But there's two forts that are very low. The one at the top lane for the blue team has barely any hit points left. And the same is even more so true for what we're seeing in the middle. Genji actually dropped. So it seems like uh, he dropped after all. 38,000 minion experience for the FBI, so they are doing pretty okay when it comes to minion experience alone. But they're falling behind on passive experience since so many structures have been taken out. They are struggling also on hero experience. And those are two big chunks that come into play for the FBI and allow them now to uh, yeah, gap, or they have to gap one and a half levels before they have any chance of playing on eye level with the enjoyers. And level 20 is now there. Another napalm shot is being fired. They were hoping to still take the fort out, which has backfired. But with level 20, there's now an opportunity for the enjoyers to not only bring the fight to the opposing team, but also to maybe get another objective. They already got two. Here comes the quick play. Nice old by Malfurion. Bit on the defensive side, but still able to pull it off. Recall is in. Tracer somehow surviving. Yeah, but damn, what an onslaught as both teams are going all out. Malta Ale dies. He's the first one to fall. Blue team is low, but they're still alive here and they're trying to go for another quick kill. They get Sergeant Hammer. Tyriel is next on the list and he dies too. It's a triple baby. They even get the quad kill 
as Tyriel falls, Malfurion falls, 10 kills to zero. And here's the big opportunity now to go for keep number two and maybe even core. They can go for the objective. The world's their oyster. The enjoyers are ruling with an iron fist here and are dropping the hammer time and time again. Literally and figuratively. Muradin is dropping a lot of them. So that's the fight that they wanted. The second they had level 20, they forced it. The FBI got caught. They didn't have level 20 talents. Now Sereni is trying to jump back here. And yeah, it's already... The, the damage is already getting unleashed. I mean, the objective is about to be taken. Here in the middle, the keep will take some damage. I don't think it is going to fall right away, but it doesn't even have to. I mean, maybe even they're getting... It is dropping a lot lower than I thought it would. And uh, all that range damage that's coming in from the Winions is quite rough. Yeah, this one is definitely going to go down once that we have the uh, cavalry in play. That's the third objective for the team. The keep is still there. And, yep, four more seconds. Big, big chance and opportunity now for the enjoyers to win the series and then move on to the next round of the loser's bracket. Grab a few more points for those leaderboards to hopefully make it into the playoffs. The FBI... <laughs> they are doing what they can to defend against this, but damn, it's going to be tough. It really is. Sergeant Emma, 64,000 damage. Tracer, 58k. But they lost two keeps already. Two armor shields are removed from the boss. And here comes the attack. Mid lane, top lane, bot lane, cavalry everywhere. And it is nearly impossible to throw anything against the opponent. I mean, they're trying, obviously. But I don't see it happening. Even with level 20 talents, which they're now finally about to get, I don't think they have a chance here. There's the holy arena. Core is already slowly falling, and half the cavalry isn't even here yet. At the top, the keep gets attacked. Sergeant Hammer doing her best to just keep them at arm's length, but it is tough. Blue team is dropping hit points too. Genji even dying here. Yeah, Ether's a bit low as well. 9,000 hit points on the core. 8,000, 7,000. Muradin is dead. They're trying to right click the shit out of it, and this might just be enough but they're getting wiped 3600 hit points the FBI ladies and gentlemen still alive Uther wants to take it by himself nearly able to pull it off here Uther a man on a mission and here comes the cavalry 3900 2500 and they still save it everybody got wiped but they're saving the day Urel is back already Ether is back but the team has been able to pull it off off the problem is simply what are they gonna do now yes your core is still alive but they gotta do something with it and i don't know what they need both bosses at the end of the day do they have enough time for this they need to take structures down tracers trying it down at the bottom of the map malfurion double checked at the top they need to do something here they have no armor shield left anymore on the core there's nothing left all the structures are destroyed and there's still forts and keeps for the enjoyers despite the fact that they just wiped the blue team what can they actually do with this they get the boss at the bottom of the map that's going to help them a bit but they haven't taken out the fort in the middle they haven't taken out the fort at the top they should have gone for both of them they need some catapults they need some counter pressure well the equivalent of counter catapults at least they can't let this push too hard against the core so they're trying the best they can but it's still tough they lost too much ground it might have been too little too late here Boss at the bottom of the map is gonna take one fort out. Yep, congratulations, but what are you gonna do with that? What are you gonna do with one fort that you destroy? You need to destroy the rest too. They go to the top to take another boss out, so good for them. Don't tell me. <laughs> oh my god. Somebody, please, please. All three forts. I mean, this is a meme and a half. Look at this. Bot lane. Mid lane. Top lane. <laughs> it's like, what? It doesn't matter if there's like one hit point or a thousand or ten thousand. You need to take these things down. Top boss taken. So at least that helps. But they need to remove the rest of the forts as well. And they also need to go for the objective. They need to win another fight big time or it is all over. Genji is trying to push some minions in. Boss at the top finally takes a fort on the first one. Congratulations. That's a round of applause. At least... At least they were able to get one. 
that bad boy might even be able to do damage at the keep if nobody defends it. Instead, the red team is currently trying their best to make a play here for the objective, which they definitely should. I wish, I would really, really hope for somebody to make a move and take the fort in the mid and the bot lane out. Just for the extra catapults. Look at Urel. She's pushing these lanes out time and time again, forcing Maltile back at this point. Top side boss is going through the wall and gate at least, but what a series. It's kind of wild. <laughs> it's really something. Top side, yes, the keep gets attacked, but they're not going to be able to take it down. We're now 22 minutes in. Stormbolt and Tyriel is dead. Tyriel is dead. The objective is not going to be claimed by the FBI. And, well, that is bad news. It seems like this is going to be the end, finally. Nice play here from Le Ming. She can't quite kill Tracer, but she got close. Malfurion is dead. Got murdered by Genji. The FBI is on the case. They're already doing some research, and uh, the investigation has indeed started. But here comes the next play for Sergeant Hammer. She's able to get away, but as mentioned, there's not a single armor shield available anymore on the red team's core. So yeah, no matter what, at this point, it's over. Two heroes are already gone. The objective is coming, so the cavalry will take this down if they even have to wait for this. 93,000 damage for Li Ming. She's top damage in the game. Bit ahead of Sergeant Hammer as well, and this is gonna be the end of it. Tracer coming in with some extra damage and looking for an additional kill, but obviously the boss gets attacked quickly here. The cavalry is now on their way. We have a five versus four, and the core is falling. The cavalry might not even make it. Tracer is already dead, gets murdered by Liming. The blue team is insanely low, but it doesn't matter anymore. Maltel is gone too, and this, ladies and gentlemen, is a 2-1 victory for the enjoyers as they move on to the next round of Banshee Cup qualifier number one. Nicely done, GG, and well played.